Hey, how you doing? Tim Warner here. This session is called Multi-Channel Public Speaking. And I'm particularly interested in gathering your feedback on this because I'd like to know if you've natively adopted this notion that I'm about to describe in your own public speaking. Anecdotally, I've spoken to some friends who are also experienced technical trainers, and they've claimed that they have something similar going on. But I've kind of systematized it and really thought about what it is. Well, what is it, Tim? Let me give it to you in a nutshell. Let's say that I'm going to give a presentation today, which I am. I'm actually giving three. During the course of the presentation, regardless of whether it's live online like Zoom or if it's standing at a podium physically, doesn't matter a bit. But I have, well, it actually does matter in some senses. I'll get to that in a moment. But I've got not one, not two, but three cognitive tracks running in parallel in my brain. And these are foundational to my success as a public speaker. I've picked this notion up. I've begun practicing this multi-channel approach through bitter experience of listening to public speakers over the course of my life and realizing to the depths of my being, I don't want to do what they do. I mean, I love to get positive uh, tips from watching speakers, but sometimes the negative examples are even more powerful. My biggest pet peeve is when a speaker gets lost in their own thoughts and they forget about time and they let their session run over or profoundly under. I find that to be disrespectful of the audience big time. So I'm OCD, I guess you would say, about ending on time. If I've got a 10-minute time marker, you can bet that at the 10-minute mark, I'm done. Simple as that. So one of these three channels that are running through my head when I present is a meta channel where I'm gauging things like, okay, I've, what's the time? How much time we have left? How's the pacing so far? Do I need to go faster? Do I need to skip something? It's a, it's a constant iteration of what's going on logistically in the room. How's my audio visual? Is the demo okay? Is my mic unmuted? That meta track is important because it keeps the presentation on an even keel. It respects the audience's time. It respects the conference organizer's time. Very important. There's also the audience track where I'm thinking to myself as I'm going on, how is everybody doing? Now, that's why I hitched a few minutes ago when I said that these three channels are the same whether I'm doing live in person or live online. They're really not in as much as when I'm live in person, I can see my audience, engage their feedback. Being an autistic dude, that's a challenge anyway, gauging feedback. But it's easier at least if I'm in front of these people and I can observe them. You see what I mean? When I'm teaching over the web, unless my students are on webcam, I have no feedback from them unless they're brave enough to chat or come off mute, whatever the case may be. But the audience channel for me is critical because the whole reason I'm presenting is to transmit new understanding to my audience. And if I'm losing them because of any number of reasons, I want to know about it so I can course correct. Now, you might be thinking, okay, Tim, you mentioned meta channel you mentioned an audience channel. What about the content? Isn't content king? Well, it is, but I find in my experience and in my philosophy, content is just one out of three interdependent legs in a three-legged stool. In other words, if a speaker is not paying attention to their audience, they're not paying attention to the logistics of their presentation, that's going to out of the gate dramatically reduce the effectiveness of any content they have to provide. They'd have to be uh, imparting some pretty important knowledge for me to overlook absences in those other two channels. But yes, the third and final channel in my multi-channel public speaking model is the content itself. And here is where I've put in a lot of time be before the presentation scoping the work. That's another pitfall I see people make, where when they're planning a talk, 
They're given a time target. Let's say it's a one hour prezzo where they'll speak for 45 minutes or 50 minutes. And then the last 15 or 10 minutes will be reserved for Q&A. So now you're down to 45 minutes. And then when you jettison the introduction, you're probably down to 40 minutes. So functionally, what are you down to in terms of talk time? The mistake I've seen people make is get way too broad and way too deep given their time constraints. It's a critical skill to be able to scope your content. And I think for me anyway, mastering that, scoping the content effectively, is a function of experience. I don't think there's any other way to get good at it other than put on the road miles and try and get out there and present and present. And then you learn based on your own behaviors, how rapidly you, you tend to present, how things go between you and your audience historically. That'll help you get a better mental picture in your mind so that when you're planning a presentation, you have a feel already based on, on the environment about how much content would be reasonable to cover in that period of time. You see what I'm saying? So this multi-channel model has kept me in very good stead over the course of my career. And I'm pretty proud of it. I'm not saying I invented it, but I haven't seen it before phrased in this way exactly. You might be agreeing, thinking, yeah, that does sound very reasonable. But the question of the day is, how does one develop this ability to carry on three simultaneous channels in your head all while you're presenting live without a net. I've given this question some thought, and I don't have enough data from other people to say anything really definitive. I do believe there's probably a bit of native aptitude involved. That old question, if you take just a random person and sit them down with a piano instructor for a year, how are they going to be at the end of that year? I think that how they're going to be on the piano at the end of the year is going to be directly related to how much native aptitude they have coming in. I think the same might be true here for public speaking. You need to have some kind of native aptitude for the craft, and then you build on it. I think if I were to sum up my guidance on how to develop this multi-channel approach, besides practice, which is the unavoidable truth, there's also self-reflection. I mentioned in another YouTube video that how I erased ums and ahs and filler words from my speech was by listening over and over again to recordings of my presentations. And before you think, what, are you some kind of malignant, nar malignant narcissist? What are you listening to your own stuff for? I do it for quality control. And frankly, when I edit my own videos, I'm listening to my own voice for hundreds or thousands of hours anyway, so I get used to it. But that hypersensitivity led me to be hyper aware of my speech. Likewise, by continuing to present over and over again, and being sensitive to things like where the audience is, where I am in the flow of the presentation, and particularly being respectful of time. I find that just like building muscles over time going to the gym, each of those three tracks, content, audience, and meta, get to be more and more robust, and they blend into each other to a degree where it doesn't feel necessarily like I have these discrete contexts that I have to switch between. It's more of a neural network. I'm starting to sling some buzzwords around here. I got to be careful, but it becomes a sort of a neural network where those three channels blend into each other. It's a great way. I can't imagine doing public speaking without this method nowadays. All right. And, and in closing, I think um, some of the fruits of practicing this multi-channel public speaking methodology is that it already out of the box puts you in the position of being a learner-centered instructor, and it also puts you into a frame of being highly respectful of your audience and of the organization that's hosting your presentation. I spoke at a presentation not too long ago, and for both of my sessions that I was presenting, both of them, the speaker before me went right up until he was supposed to end at like 15 after, and then I'd have 15 minutes to get set up. He went right over the 15 so that I only had like a minute left before showtime. He wasn't doing that maliciously. 
He just had, in my opinion, poor time management skills. But the net effect is that he inconvenienced his audience because they had to rush to get to their next session. And I had to rush to get prepared for mine. You see, so that's a really good concrete example on how paying attention to time and planning and delivering your public speaking gigs benefits everybody. Well, we're at the 10 minute mark, speaking of timeliness. So I'm going to wrap it there. Thanks again. I'll see you later.